Time for Fools. We're back. The- um, so we got to know where we left off. But- Saying that um, you had you, you you had to, um, when you do the Audible. I read you, along with it. You read along to it or else you won't get it. Right. So when I was then. When I was at East LA College, community college, I took a I took a bunch of units, bro. Too many. I guess the limit was fifteen. Right. I took fifteen. And I took psychology. And whenever a teacher would talk, cause and the, I would never get it, bro. Cause they they were talking about the they were like off they were on book, not off book. When they were off book, and talk about their lives and other stuff, and then talk about math. Oh, I got it. But when they were just talk strictly, I didn't get it. When it was like information, information, bro, that off the book, on the book, and they're just saying it like a robot. I never got it. I would have to read the chapter that was gonna be discussed that day at least five times, and then when she tells us at the end of the class, finish up the chapter, I'll read it five more times, bro. Right. And I didn't. Pa- I passed the class. But I didn't get an A or a B because I, I didn't turn a, turn in a term paper. It's like I needed a class on term papers. I've never. How do you do it? I, 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 when you were telling a me thesis earlier about this, or whatever, you know, I have you know, I no idea. Not, I have no fucking clue. I, I can read a thesis. I'm sure I've read a term paper or somebody's like thesis on something. I, I have don't no even idea know what, what a means, term though. paper is, bro. Philip, you ever did a term paper? What does a term paper mean? But it's ah, long, huh? It's like it's like an essay, okay. And there's like, um, I don't know, man. See, that's why we're the one day we'll do the history of, for fools on fucking term papers, the which history, will be a long, the boring history of, the episode history of fools. Like, <laughs> like, okay, because uh, this is all <laughs> ties in with with cinema anyway, because reading and um, listening, it all ties in with writing a movie. And writing a movie is a different part of an art, you know? Right. Well, it, what we were talking for about me, was... For me, basically, bro, I don't know how to write a book report. What we were talking about ultimately was that statistically we're, we're under- bad learners. Eh? Yeah, we're bad learners. Slow well, do you, learners. Do you have, I'm slow. And I'm not stupid. I'm just a right. slow learner. Well, I thought I was stupid for a long time, and it's what I would tell my son because he's, he's, he's a slow learner. Um, and what I realized is that some people can get... Like when I give, when you get a feed of information, some people know how to break it down. Some people could soak it all in. Most people break down the most important parts. I think people like me and you um, are people who need to soak up all the information to in order to understand it. And and so it takes a little longer. And that's what the slow comes from. It's not that I'm stupid and I can't do it. It's just that I I'll, I need to completely understand what you're saying. Are telling me, so I need to soak up all this information. I need to read it over and over a few times. I think the problem with me in school, I just realized it right now, was comedy. Is that I watched so much comedy when I was little, you know, with my yeah. parents and funny movies. Right. That every time somebody that was an adult that was not my mom and dad would talk, I would try to find something funny about it. Right. Yeah. And I'm more focusing on the funny things about what they're saying. Right. Because I'm not listening to what they're saying. You're looking for the funny parts. Like, I'm looking at him like, oh, that's an ugly ass tie. But that's your comedy brain now. I mean, if, like, well, we back have... then, though, I couldn't even right. listen, bro. My mind, like, I remember my history teacher talking. Yeah. And we live, we're live across the street from Roosevelt High School. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just listening to the band, bro. Right. And I could barely hear it, bro. Right. Barely hear it. <laughs> you have ADD. I, I, I could hear boom, boom, Do you have ADD? Did you get diagnosed with ADD or was there ever an official diagnosis? One day we'll do the history of ADD <laughs> and, and anxiety yeah. and, lun- and lunatics right. in, in Mexico because that's something nobody deals with. Right. So just, they just yeah, there's no ADD in Mexico. Just look at you go like this. ¿Qué pasó con él? ¿Está loco? <laughs> Which is what my grandmother would say. What loco? Yeah, my gra- my like it, I took it because my grandmother's old school and she was just like he's crazy. There's something wrong with him. And my mom was like, yeah, he has ADD. And she's like, let's tell you, man. Thing. People had never dealt with that, man. We're in 2020, 2023, and people are barely d- d- learning how to deal with a a person with ADD. ADHD, ADD, depression, anxiety, oh, uh, bipolar, like we're oh, all. What do they say when uh, when uh, someone shoots somebody and oh, they're white? Oh, post-traumatic disorder. Or they're white, he had problems, what? Oh, um. 
They always say that, man. What's the word they use all the time? Mentally, he was mentally ill, yeah, right? Mentally that, Ill. That's the new word, mentally ill. Before, man, they would say, the, the news would say, a crazy man I broke never, out yeah. with a pistol, started randomly shooting people. But now, but now they just say, I always know that when um, a serial killer, not serial killer, but when, a, when um, <laughs> the guy who shot everybody is white. Right. Because they always say, a unknown assailant. Right. Or authorities have not released the yes. identity. Right. But when it's a black person, you know? Like what, a black male adult. Yeah. Yeah. But what, they should just say it like this, man. Listen, uh, a mentally ill person grabbed his dad's gun, dressed up like Rambo, <laughs> and decided <laughs> to make it his day. Right. I mean, I feel like if you go kill anybody, you're mentally ill. Like the the whole like uh, that there there's something wrong. Fuck yeah, there's something wrong with you if you could kill another human being. Bro, did you ever watch that show with John Berenthal, um, Punisher? I started to, but it sucked so bad I stopped watching it. They get you with that one mile sniper shot. That's it, huh? Bro, l- listen, I'm a Punisher fan, dog. That's that's I'm a, I I love the the comic after that, after watching that series, you put that to punish yourself. Uh, exactly, dude. That series. Everything, everything on TV and movies in in regards to the Punisher is fucking garbage, except for the original Punisher movie with Dolph Lundgren. It was rad. It came close. Nice try, but other than that, fucking, th- th- for some reason, Marvel cannot not fuck up Punisher. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider D- again, dude. Nick Cage is Ghost Rider. Get the fuck out of here, dude. His hair was burned. Oh God, dude! What a fucking crock of shit. That's why I don't. I don't. I don't. Dude, don't get me started on these fucking Nar- Marvel movies that are just not even like the fucking comic book. But whatever. Hey, if I were a millennial or a zillennial, I would look at you and go, "Oh, this baby boomer right here. <laughs> he wants clean East wants to play Superman." <laughs> no, no, no! I want it to be accurate. This guy right yeah. here, this Zillennial here, this this grandpa here, this 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 baby boomer right here, <laughs> he wants Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the Flash. <laughs> Why can't you stick to the script, you damn youngins? <laughs> you know it's funny when when uh, when whenever a Zillennial or a Millennial calls someone a boomer, right. that person. Ninety nine percent of the time is not a boomer. No, I'm. He's dude, a, you know he's, a genera- a boomer? he's a generation. He's a generation X. People, baby boomers were born in the nineteen forties. There are parents. There are parents. Yeah, they're people. Because you know why they call them boomers? Because they were like the people. There was the boom after the war. It was after all the soldiers came home, fucked the shit out of their wives, and had fucking babies. grabbing nurses and kissing them without even asking. I'm them. in my forties. It's my fucking dad. People in their seventies. What did you say? Oh, sorry, um, dude. My, I mean, my my dad is in his seventies. People in their seventies and eighties are boomers. You guys, I'm Let a me, complaining Gen Xer. For anybody who's there listening right now, if you were a zillennial or a millennial or a, I don't know what else, don't send me death. Anybody notes. that looks like Cheech and Chong's age is a baby boomer. Yes. Yes. Cheech and Chong are baby boomers. Yes, anybody that could, um, anybody that goes that that could honestly s- looks at you and go, "Man, Nixon was a bad president." That's a boomer. Right, right. Or anybody posting memes. About anybody Joe saying Biden on stuff like, "When I was a little kid, Jimmy Carter," that's a Generation <laughs> X. <laughs> anybody that says yeah. the good old days is a baby boomer. Right. Anybody that says back in the day is a Generation X. That's a good point, yes. Back in the day, Generation X, the good old days, baby boomers. And when you guys, the millennials or generation, uh, millennials, you guys, gotta be, you guys are living in the present, so you have nothing to say right now. Right. Well, millennials. Millennials are starting to have something to say. They're in their 30s. Bro, there's, there's, there's millennials looking at millennials like they're boomers, bro. Yeah. Yeah, and well, it's fun to see millennials t- turn get into their thirties and go. Oh, I get it now. But the the battle, I think it is because people like who are my age, Generation X. Right. You know, I won't I won't put it on me because you know I chose a career that 
I took a gamble on life. You know what I mean? And that's something a baby boomer wouldn't do. You know, I took a gamble on life. You know, and anybody that tells you, um, oh, man, back in the days, I was I would work at my job and I would just stay there. That person right there is Generation X was a little bit of baby boomer. Those people, they don't understand the new generation. The generation, the new generation knows better now. Like a zillennial or a millennial, they're not gonna stay at a shitty job as long as we did. No. <laughs> That's what right they're I applaud them for that. I love that attitude. Like, I love I love this whole new attitude of That's like, the attitude. I yeah. wish I had the attitude when I was in my twenties. Yeah, now it's too late. I saw this Reddit and it said, What do you hope will go away when all the boomers are gone? And someone was all bragging about working a sixty hour week. And I was like, Yes. Please thank you. Like, stop, dude. Like, like it's something to brag about. You make a fuck ton of money, but it's like, oh, I went, I worked super hard, put a roof over my kids' ho- ho- head, and but I never saw them because I was fucking working. That's not cool. The way hey, the you should live like this. I think the the um, the you know the way their um their mentality and their their rea- their the way they do things. Right. It's the, it's the way that we really wanted to do it, but. We couldn't. We didn't have the balls. Because we were our kids. Well, we didn't have the balls to tell our yeah, parents. Yeah, because our, our parents, right. our parents were scared because their parents lived through a depression. Well, my dad used to go. You know what I love about you? Or my and my grandfather was like, "Son, you have a great work ethic." But in the back of my head, I was like, I fucking hate working. Bro. I hate, I don't want to work one more day in my life. I do this because I don't want you to say I don't have a good work ethic. I'm not proud to say this, bro, but I've never had, I've never been in a job long enough to get benefits. Yeah, neither have I. Cause I or a day off. Because I can't. I cannot. Ever. Uh, bro, I'm this all day long. Do you know how hard it is to tuck in my fuck you to the world as as I move out into the world? And some dude who fucking doesn't do shit with his life either has some fucking sway over me because he makes fucking 75 cents more and he's my and his title's manager. Go fuck yourself you, and go you, fuck your mother. You sound like a guy that has a dirty toaster oven at home. I do. You've seen my toaster oven. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, man, but, but I think um, I, I'm not. A, I don't know anything, but that's the attitude I like about the young generation, yeah. bro. Is that they're not gonna stay working at Walmart forever, bro? Well, so okay, and, and they're down to fight somebody at Waffle House. And swinging back into our subject, can you imagine? Oh, nice. Um, uh, I just ate at the Waffle House the other day when we were in Tucson. I got up that morning, and I threw it all up. I see Waffle House shit all the time. It, that, I don't know if that it was that particular Waffle House, but man, that shit was disgusting. Um, but I get why people go because there's a lot of entertaining people there. Um, but you, anyway, would you brag about meeting somebody's mom at a Waffle House later? No, <laughs> no, I would. I would tell I bet you. you if you were to tell somebody I met your mom at a Waffle House, <laughs> his next question would be, "Was she fighting or working there?" <laughs> I look like I date people from Waffle House. Oh, yeah, sorry. History for Fools. We're back. We're back, people, and we're talking about Latin cinema, and we got off the subject because, you know, we're two guys that hardly ever see each other. Yeah. And um, we, we, we were together in Arizona, and let me tell you, man, we were sick as fuck. Oh, when we were in Tempe. Tempe. That was fucking crazy, bro. I didn't I, know if we were gonna survive. <laughs> bro, when I got home, I, I was having I had acid reflux. Right. Like I would eat, hit a board, and throw up. And then um that went that went for another week. I couldn't believe you were smoking because you had told me that through messaging. And I was like, dude, I couldn't smoke for like a week, like a month after that. Like I was like, my lungs were tore back, dude. Bro, if I would have died, yeah, people would have laughed at and my Google searches, bro, after I, before, right before I died. Why, why, why did you? Can you smoke a bowl with COVID? <laughs> can you smoke a bowl with phlegm? Your whole, can you, <laughs> your whole can you thing, die after? Dude, that's so funny. Because most people would be like, I have all these symptoms. Am I going to die? You're like, can I at least smoke weed with I'm these like, symptoms? I'm like, all my, all my Google searches would be like, how long can you wait after, to, to smoke after a root canal? You know what that reminds me of, though, is when you told me that time that you did, they played that uh, fake prank on you about we were getting bombed, like the, the nuclear attack. And yeah. you thought, like, 
and you thought that we were getting attacked and you were like and i was like what was your first thought and you were like i wanted to ask him if i could have a pound like since we we're all gonna die anyway and i was like fuck yeah bro the first thing on your mind was like marijuana i need more marijuana bro i was like take that shit to the roof yeah. and wait for that bomb <laughs> Put it in a big old leaf blower and put your face to the other end, dude. Yeah, totally. Totally. You think when um, when there's a movie, how come like when there's a movie, bro? Yeah. Like Crazy Rich Asians. Yes. You saw it? No. It is amazing. Is it, it a is good movie? a beautiful, funny movie, Get bro. Get the fuck out of here. It is hilarious. Get out of here. It is hilarious, bro. It shows the power of Chinese people in a different sense. You know, like you see Chinese people, you know, they're, they're carrying people or they're, they're all on bicycles. You right. know, they show you that part. But they never show you like the, the Chinese people who are like from other islands right. who are rich. Like, dog, Rich. rich, like stinking fucking crazy. Bro, rich. rich, like they're from Singapore, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff, you been to Japan, mm -hmm. you know that what's illegal in Singapore, right? Oh, Singapore is crazy laws, dude. Yeah. yeah, so they're so these people are so rich that they couldn't smoke or, or do anything bad in Singapore. That the bachelor party was in a in a big ass one of those big old tankers like a that, barge? that carries that carries those big old ships. Yeah. The ships that carry those trailers. Right. Well, they hire one of those, bro. Whoa. To throw the party there. No, like a tanker. You're talking about like a big tanker. A big tanker, bro. To wow. have and they made it all into a club with rooms, bro. And a, and like a club, bro. With chicks, everything, bro. Oh, wow. So they could be legally there. Okay. And the chicks. They went to go have a bachelorette party in an island. Yeah. Where when they got there, there was nothing but clothing there, bro. Like, even some like, other like there was like shopping for them there, but wow. it was all free. Like all Louis Vuitton. All and that so stuff. this movie is about stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's about um a, a rich, 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 rich Asian guy that owns half of Singapore. Yeah. And um, marrying a regular chick. No shit. But he, okay. he he lied about he lied about um. He lied about he lied that he was rich. The rich Asian was a man, a badass movie, bro. Like all Chinese people, all Asian actors, right? Um, Jimmy O Yang, um, Miss, Miss Doctor Ken Ken Wong, um, a lot of recognizable Asian people that I know. Badass movie, bro. I mean, there it was, man. I learned I learned a lot about the Asian co the Chinese culture, man. I didn't know that. Do we um, have anything like that? I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know. We do, bro. Blood and blood out. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know that Asian people on for Christmas they eat KFC. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I and, that. and also, man, if you're a Chinese with curly hair, it's like uh, if, if if that means you made it, bro. Really? It, like you're the like that's that's the thing to have right there. Yeah, I learned okay. that in um that movie that show Fresh Off the Boat. Right. It's a success perm they call it. A success Get perm. Get the fuck out of here. That's why in um all the Bruce Lee movies, the right. bad guy, the Chinese guy had curly hair. No way. That makes so much sense now. Cause you know, if you're rich and oh, Asian. Oh yeah. I always rich, thought that was weird. If you're rich and you're Asian, you're you're like you can get you, a perm. You want to throw it in their face? Yeah. You get that little curly hair, bro. You go get a perm. Nice. All right. The success perm. The success perm. We don't have that. No. I have an uncle who has a perm, but he's not at all successful. Let me tell you, man, I don't know what happened, bro, to sometimes, bro, like like Latina women, you know, like not Latina women, but like I have aunts. I would say my side of the family, you know, like. Like my side of the family, my aunts, they all look like Tina Turner, bro. Really? Like with that wig, the makeup. Oh, like an older lady trying to look hot still. <laughs> with like long legs, and they're like they out there look, strutting. They all look like the bad person in a in a novella, bro. Soap <laughs> opera. Ah, the bad lady. She's the one that shows up at a party and it gets quiet and it cuts to the commercial. Right. I remember watching those with my grandmother. 
Yeah, man. So you think um, when when that movie Crazy Rich Asian, it made a billion dollars, bro? I remember it being very popular. But um, but but there was still like some white people, you know, on the, on the social media, mainly social media, not publicly. Nobody has the balls to say it in person, in an interview or nothing. But they were like, oh, there was no white people in that movie. Oh. Yeah. Did they say that really? Yeah, of course it did. That's fucking crazy. You're yeah. in every other fucking movie. Yeah, man. But then, but the, but there, when 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 I see it, when I read these comments, I'll, that white people put out, like especially like Black Panther, oh, there were no white people, you know, whatever. Right. Or uh, BET, you know, all of them, they have their own black station. They're not seeing what we see every day. Do you remember the we, name of the black character in uh, Top Gun? No, because there's none. There's no fu- there's like uh, one black guy in the back. That's, that's what it. in my head I was looking for a name. I was gonna say champ. <laughs> no. Oh, so so remember we're we're talking about inventing Latinos. Right, yeah. And when we when I said that in the whole book, she broke down um Latinos in film for about a, a chapter. Yes. Which is a very informative chapter. What did you like about that? Bro. You were talking to me about that earlier. We're talking about the Matrix and be, and seeing it, not being woke, but actually seeing it. Right. And like, and it makes sense, bro. I was watching regular television the other day, like a regular show, and it went to a commercial. Right. And it was like first it showed like a white person selling a BMW, bro. Right. 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 It was just a white guy. Totally okay. And then they showed um, detergent. They, they showed. Um, um, some other commercials, whatever, right? More, more commercials, but then they show a, a commercial with multiracial people in it. Okay. It was a uh, black dude, uh, a fucking um, uh, a black dude, uh, a fucking Mexican guy, and some Caribbean-looking Mexican dude, and um, <laughs> and then um, a fucking Asian guy and a Vietnamese-looking guy. And it was like, hey, don't forget to check for your diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I know you're poor and unhealthy, so make sure you take care of your diabetes with whatever money you have left over or that fucking Medicare service you have to apply for. Hey, That's exactly hey, what hey, that fucking bullshit is, like, dude. Like, if you want to, that's the representation that we get on commercials sometimes. Yeah. Sickle cell, sickle cell anemia has you down. Oh yeah, earthquake <laughs> will do the commercial. <laughs> Yeah, dude, I, fu- I I notice that shit all the time, especially with, like, diabetes commercials or, like, fucking... Memory loss. Yeah, it's like, dude, oh, my God, dude, are you reaching a demographic or what, you know? And, uh, I mean, it, like, that's the thing is I notice on a lot of my uh, videos, I get a lot of pitches for EBT <laughs> like like oh do you have an EBT card use our service and it's like how the fuck do you know I have an EBT card motherfucker is it because of my last name is it the videos I'm looking up like they know they know how to appeal to us they, but know they, to- they saw you eating cake cereal <laughs> they saw me eating the fake kicks <laughs> Ooh, how bad is that cereal <laughs> it's awful it's so awful for bro. real dog like so um um so they are, then they like to watch it more television, right? And then they show um, what they show. Oh, they show like um, they were promoting um Valencia, California, like a, a great place to live, right? right? But they didn't show no black people in it. <coughs> they didn't right. show no Mexicans in that yeah. commercial. All they show you was buildings, bro. Well, and that's the thing, man, is that they're like, I mean, you know. We're only like minutes away from downtown LA. Right. Who are you telling that to? Somebody who doesn't live in California? Well, they're going, well, who can afford it? Nah, bro. They're lying. They're trying to get white people from other states to move in because every white person that lives in LA knows that it don't take minutes to get anywhere. Right. You're fucking right. When was the last time you made it to the airport from my house or anybody's house in LA you in live, five minutes? If you live close to the airport. Where, or in Frisco, the bay. Right. Where, where can you get to in minutes? Nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere, bro. Nowhere. You, it takes, like, because the bay is not as much traffic as LA, but it still takes, like, dude, it took me an hour to get to San Francisco, and in no traffic, it's 10 minutes from my house. So, bro, and then I show, they showed an ad for, 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 um, for Tide. And um, it was a, a, a Latina lady, bro, cleaning her, cleaning all the clothes for her family. No. 
Bro, I saw a commercial, bro, during the holidays. Um, this guy is getting ready to make dinner for the first time for, for his, his family. Right. And he's Latino. Yeah. But the whole time, bro, his his mom is there like a ghost. Oh, Jesus. And she's watching him cook everything, make <laughs> like sure there's everything bro, right. That's actually very accurate. <laughs> like, la- as far as Latinos go, whoever did their research, like, there's some Mexican dude in that room right there making, the- he's like, no, nah, listen, man, when I'm cooking, because, like, I swear to God, bro, I don't cook Mexican food because I'm afraid my mom will tap me on the shoulder and be like, you're fucking it up, you fucking idiot. But then um, after, like, uh- and then his wife might be white or something, but then after the dinner is all done, his his mom is in one of those photos. I think she winks. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, this is that see that's way too familiar. I I actually applaud that like that appeal to to our culture because that means that someone who was making the decisions in that marketing ad was Latino. Because there's no fucking way like that they could have figured that out on their own. He's from Santa Rosa. <laughs> He's from East Palo Alto, homie. So yeah, man. And then I remember a movie with Salma Hayek and that dude from Friends, the drug addict one. Oh yes. What was the name? Matt. Some Matt LeBlanc. Yeah. It was Matt LeBlanc and Salma Hayek falling down. No, not my, 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 not falling down. Not uh, my LeBlanc is the other one, the one that did drugs. Oh, what was it? I know which one you're talking about, though. It takes place in Las Vegas, kind of. Yeah, and it's, it's, I forgot the name of the movie, bro, but I, I guess they hook up the next day. Like, they get married. They got right. married. Yeah, they got drunk and got married. They got drunk something. and got married, but I, I forgot the name of the Knocked Up? No, not the name of the movie. No. What's the name of that movie, Philip? And uh, anyway, so they go to... Uh, so they go to her side of the family because she's Mexican, right? Bro. Fool. There's like a there's like at least fifty people. Fools rush in. in. <laughs> they go to her house, yeah, and they have the back. They're about to have dinner, and they, the the the, uh, the where they're gonna eat. They have those flaps like it's gonna be a birthday party, right? Yeah, they're streamers. Oh, I remember that when he- this guy's playing guitar like. <laughs> Like fucking like the Gypsy Kings, bro. Yes. And it's only dinner, bro. Right. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. I remember that. How did you feel about that movie when you watched it? Bro, I, 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 I mean, did you I, feel that they were accurate? Fuck no. No. Yeah. First of all, nobody in my family knows how to play guitar. No. <laughs> There's not a mariachi we, in every family. Is we that can, what you're saying? We can't get 50 people to show up together at one time, bro. Right. Yeah. If, I, if we were to invite 50 people for something like that, like in that movie, right. I would say 10 will show up first, and then we're going to wait another hour for another 15 to show up. By the time we eat dinner, bro, it'll be 2 in the morning, bro. Right. Yeah, dude. Yeah. We didn't have events like that at all. At all. Like, in fact, there was no, like, fucking flair or, like. And also, man, if she has a big-ass family like that with her, how come they were not in fucking Vegas with her? Tell her not, not to fuck that white dude. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I remember watching that and going, but, this movie's bullshit. But that was in the 90s, right? Yeah. But imagine, like, the Latino films back in the 1920, la, la, silent films. Right. Like the, well, and that's what we're, what we're talking Ru- about here. Rudolph Valentino. Rudolph Valentino. Well, he was Italian, huh? He's an Italian. But I'll tell you, you know, as we're getting into the golden age of Mexican cinema, which is what I wanted to start with. Go ahead, man. Um. It, because when we're talking about uh, Latinos in film, <sighs> I will say that, man, like, we are more prolific in film than I really thought we were uh, before I started reading up on this stuff. What do you mean? In fact, that we have such a major role in film. Even though we are underrepresented in the industry, we have a major role in it, and it starts in Mexico. It starts at a time when um, World War II is starting up, the Mexican Revolution is ending, um, and uh, see at the time. So Mexico was not in World War Two; they were out of it. They were out of it for a moment, and and it was and and it was long enough to give that at the time. So World War Two is kicking up. The Mexican Revolution is ending, and as World War Two is kicking up, we're no longer making movies in Hollywood because we're rationing all the supplies that we have. 
Mexico has does not have that problem because they're not involved in a war yet. And so um, they start kicking up movies. Now, again, also, we are making movies in America, but they're war movies. And the other thing is we're not allowed to distribute movies in the Europe. Europe, into Europe or most of the world because of World War II. Yeah, um, America films and all their cartoons at, that one, at the time of World War II were all like anti-German making fun of Germany, right. laughing at Hitler. And if you, if you watch the, the, the Three Stooges of that time also, the Three Stooges films, they're making fun of Hitler. Right. Which oh, was cartoons. A, was, I mean, was it a funny... In uh, the Japanese, too. Everything. Everything was, was focused on the war effort. So Mexico was actually doing real movies. Well, the other thing, too, is is Mexico just got out of a revolution. And there's and this, is a, this, this revolution lasted a decade. And it was long and it was treacherous. One of the other things that I had to do is because I'll be honest with you, I knew that I knew a little bit about the Mexican Revolution, but I didn't completely understand it. And when I read about it, we're talking about a very bloody long war. And Mexicans are sick of war. They don't want to see any more war. And all that the movie industry is putting up is war films. Yeah, and then the Mexican Revolution was not like it, it was like almost like the the American Revolution where. There was like so many clans that that they needed to get together. That's why the American Revolu- Revolution later on they're called the United States because it took um it took you know the car the U.S. the the, the newly U.S. Congress Benjamin Franklin George right. Washington people higher than them to actually go out there and unite these states. You know with, with, without the South. And their long range rifles, right. it would have been a tough war. So, so same in Mexico. Right. You had the Zapatistas, which was the guy Zapata. He right. had his own army. You had one then you had the you had Pancho Villa. Right. They were called the Villistas. The Villistas, yes. Then you had um, Hidalgo. Right. And then you got all these people. But I don't know if these people ever really got together as one pack. No, and it's still and I mean if you go on about it, it still it, there was no finite end to the revolution and 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 Mexico maybe less than a decade ago had finally recovered from the revolution but was already going into a pitfall from uh cartel shit. But this sets up a very golden time for uh Mexican cinema because also at the beginning of the Mexican Revolution uh, as we talked about, Thomas Edison, Mexican-born, um, uh, created what was called the kinetoscope. A very, Thomas Edison. A very early, you know, you look into the thing and you spin the you spin the wheel and it shows you uh, pictures. So at the beginning of the Mexican Revolution is when Thomas Edison had uh, first invented that. That evolved into um, a, a bigger, larger operation of a projector and making movies. Um, so you now have a guy, cause I got to go back a little bit before the beginning of, of Mexican cinema and you have a guy, um, that started, this guy is, um, you know, you're gonna hear a lot about, oh, this guy is the godfather and, um, this guy was, you know, but I'll tell you the, I feel like the most important person in film was uh let's see where i put it where did i put the notes here no no even before him um how the fuck do i okay salvador baragon salvador toscano baragon was one of the first people to get his hands on um uh a, a, a projector or not i'm sorry a film camera of like a filmmaking camera um, he was one of the first ones to get him in Mexico. What year was that? Like nineteen hundred? Um, dude, we're talking eighteen ninety seven. Eighteen ninety six, close. Eighteen ninety six. Yeah, that's right. Um, the um, the uh, the cinematography camera was introduced into Mexico. Um, it was first introduced in the World Four World's Fair in eighteen ninety five, and it's made its way into Mexico around eighteen ninety six. Baragón bought this camera. And he was the first one to make movies, but then he realized very quickly he had nowhere to put his movies up. So he started opening up theaters. So this guy virtually set up the the frame for the golden era of, of Mexican cinema because he started opening up theaters 
everywhere. And at that time, there were these short, silent films that you could go watch. They were playing a lot of American films. Um, but again, now we're dipping into World War II. There's no resources in America. They're only making war movies. And the rest of the world is craving um, non-war movies, and especially Mexico, especially all of Latin America. So now you have... Um, you have uh, There's a lot of singing in those movies, huh? There is a lot of singing in those movies. So now you have a guy named Fernando de Fuentes. Fernando de Fuentes. And this guy is considered the godfather of the golden age of, of Mexican cinema. Now, Mexico at the time isn't as poor or corrupt anymore as as it is now or as it was before. This is actually a very good age for Mexico. They have a stable government. Things are going good for them. They start kicking up films. Mexico takes note. Now, we get into the war a few years later because we have a tanker that gets bombed, or Mexico has a tanker that gets bombed. By Germans, huh? By Germans. Allegedly. And they're like, hey, exactly. <laughs> Bro, you catch on very quickly. As soon as yes. I, I read that part, yeah. that the Mexico was bombed by, by some Germans, and they only bombed that part? Right. Because the Americans have been trying to get them to get into the war for a minute. But even when Mexico did get into the war, they did a very good job. And, and they were considered uh, the adoration of the world at the time because they didn't have a lot of resources, but they were willing to get into this war. So what happened was that they were able to get their hands on a ton of re resources because other countries were giving them resources. So now you have a movie-making process, um, but Mexico takes note of it and opens up a bank exclusively. It's called the, the Bank uh, for Mexican Film. And, and it's exclusively made to be funding um, all Mexican films. El Banco del Cine. Yes, something like that. Um, and so, so, so <laughs> Mexico... But there are producing films to make, to rep, to make me Mexico look, so the people could see me how beautiful Mexico is all over the world. Right. But the other thing is, man, is that this wasn't just Mexican people who were into this. And it wasn't people like, oh, these Mexican films are rad. Like, Mexico became the new Hollywood at this time. And, 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 and especially for Latin America, like if you were from Argentina, Brazil, like anywhere in Latin America, Cuba, um, Cuba Mexico City was where you needed to go. Mexico City was actually the Hollywood of Mexico. And it's where you needed to go uh, to be in, in, the, in the new Latin film industry. And and so and me and again, Mexico was able to supply Europeans with their films. And, and, and so now you have this whole world watching um, this new uh, spring of, of, uh, of cinema come out. Now, a lot of those actors uh, that were started in that age came on, and this is why today it affects us as, Amer as Mexican-Americans or Chicanos or whatever you'd like to call yourself. This very much affects American cinema. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk about some of the people in, in Mexican cinema because there's a large crossover. Because as the war, as World War II ended, now you have all these great actors coming out of Mexico, coming over to America. But you also have some actors that are like, fuck you, America. I'm staying here. This is my country. These are my people, and I'm going to keep it real. Um, so, you know, um, let's see. You know, the, the first time they... When they showed a movie in America, it might have been the World's Fair. They showed a a, a locomotive, a train, just a, a train coming. Right. And those people that saw that on film for the first time, guess what they did? They ran. Because they thought it was coming after them. Really? Because that was like the first time. Because when, when they were shooting, making movies back in the beginning, they were just showing like, oh, somebody is swimming, or they'll show a, a car moving or a train passing by that's it right or an animal right well that was the first expert and yeah. we we're talking about going that's what he was doing um now so so when we talk about actors in mexican cinema i kind of created a them and us in my mind so i don't think there was a them and us for them maybe there was but there was two types of actors in mexico at the time there was the spanish griot uh, cre what is it, Criollo or whatever, uh, very pure Spanish blood, because the Mexican Revolution was basically about pure Spanish bloods versus native indigenous Mexicans. And, and there was, it was a class war and all that stuff. 
So you have a lot of people um, that like were starting in cinema that were these a lot of these people were very well educated. They were Spanish blood. They went to colleges um, in America. Like uh, De Fuentes went to Tulane in in uh, Mississippi. No, uh, where's the Big Easy at? Uh, New Orleans. New Orleans. So you have all these people that are like they're like they're rich. They're rich, basically rich white people in Mexico. That they're Mexicans. They're certainly Mexicans, but they don't have any indigenous blood in them. But and so you you know uh, some of those people. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of them, like Emilio Fernandez. Uh, you know, and that's a very and I, I'm not saying don't be proud of this because there still are people, and it's still at a you know at a time you know where like. Um, it is still a great thing, but Emilio Fernandez is one of Emilio Fernandez is also one of the is someone that's very famous uh, because he's the um, Oscar. You know when you hold an Oscar, you're holding a Mexican. You're holding a Mexican in your yeah, head. Yeah, Emilio. You're holding Emilio. He's Fernandez. A, he's the, he the actor and a dancer. Whatever. Dude, and and he was incredible. He was very prolific as well because he was a singer and a musician. A f- an actor, a great actor, to the point of where they like fucking modeled the statue of an award, the most famous award after him. But he was also a filmmaker. Like he made he made his own films, and that was the thing you're gonna find with all these people, man. Like Pedro Infante, who was it? Like this, that's my favorite dude out of everybody, and I think all of Mexico loved him as well because there's a street kid yeah. of indigenous culture who was the biggest fucking deal at the time singer dancer singer dancer actor, actor boxer dude every a fi- did you know he's a pilot with 3000 hours of pilot experience damn and that's how he died he crashed twice before he died and then the third time he he finally died and he would fly military planes everything man um but um yeah you're going to find a lot of these people you know um uh, have a lot. They're all. They're like these multi-talented human beings. This is not like fucking Tom Cruise, who's just an actor in movies. You know, take Tom Cruise, make him a great singer, and not only that, he's a good singer. He's selling fucking platinum albums, and then make him a director. And not he's not just directing trash movies. He's directing fucking global. And like a lot of these are Glo- Golden Globe Award winners. Bro, I saw a movie, bro, with, with all J- Nazis where. Tom Cruise, the only one speaking with an American accent. Which movie was it? Oh, the it's that black and white one, that Francis Ford Coppola one, right? Yeah. How was that? I've never seen that. I would have to say nine. <laughs> which, which is and no. I'm imagining you're not saying the number. Which, which is no in German. That was an old, that was an old joke, bro. Old Poli, old Polish joke. How do you stop ten Polish guys from raping a, a German woman? No, 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 did you hear about those twelve Polish guys that were that were raping a a German woman? She was yelling nine, nine, and three left. <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> um. All right, let's. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, and that's the thing, man, is like, uh, I, wa- I really wanted to walk away from this, giving us some information that we could be very proud of and very happy about. And I wanted to start with people like, um, with Flor Silvestre, um, Pedro Infante, or Cantin Floss. Is it like Cantin Floss is another one of my favorite. Mario Moreno Cantin Floss. Yes, I was going to say, a lot of people don't know. Do you know where his name came from? Do you know why he created that name? No. Nah. He was in the circus originally. So his kid's very poor, very street, has both his parents, but they're all working really, really hard to survive. And he's sneaking off to go be in the circus um, at night. And in order for his parents not to find out, he took a bunch of different uh, meanings of his name and put it together and made up its own word, which was Cantin Flas. And so that was his name in the circus. And that's where he got popular. People loved him in the circuses. So then from there, he went to the theaters. And then he got famous in the theaters. And then um, he was introduced to a guy um, named Jorge Negrete. Jorge Negrete, he's a singer. Right. And who an passed actor. away young. And, an act- and he passed away very young. Yeah, Jorge Negrete, Javier Solis, 
Alfredo Jimenez. Okay. When those guys passed away, when they died, that's when Vicente Fernandez started blowing up because they were, all the three t- great singers pa- passed away within a short time together. It was called the Triangle of Something. I just read about it this morning. Those three guys died? Yes. Yeah, and there's like a, it was called the Triangle of Death. Or yeah, Pedro Infante, Jorge Negrete, and Alfredo Jimenez died. And, and so then Javier, where, so, yeah. Javier Solis. Yeah. And that's where, um, who? After they, those guys passed away, that's when um, Vicente Fernandez started getting more no popular. Oh, shit. So then there's, okay, so then that's the trajectory, right? Yeah. Okay. Also, man, I'd like to note that um, how long was the golden age of Mexico cinema? 40s, uh, 40s to 50s. It was very brief. Yeah, and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just in Mexico, this. No. In Cuba. Everywhere. In Cuba, there was a, a big goal. A, a golden age was very even shorter than Mexico, but they had one. Oh, really? Yeah, and it was very. And then also the one in Venezuela and all the different countries. Nineteen thirty to nineteen sixty nine. And um, Mexico. What well, and in the in the fifties? Sorry, you're you're right. In the fifties, when they after World yeah, War Two, right. after World War Two and during the Cold War and. Um, a lot of a lot of um, directors, a lot of screenwriters and movie directors from Hollywood, they were being blacklisted for being communist, and by um, that's kind of what killed it uh, for us here. And so at that time, those people couldn't find work, so they all moved to Mexico and started making films in Mexico, right. which helped spread the golden age of of that's film cool. in Mexico even further to the 1960s. But you have like people like Ramon Navarro, who started out at the Golden Age, came over here and was doing silent, and then, um, and then started doing talkies. Cause that's the thing. he was the one that started the Latin Lover, huh? Yeah. So when you were talking about um, Rudolph, uh, R- Rudolph, Rudolph Valentino. Okay. There he died really quick. Um, he didn't have a long career. No. He, he died very shortly, and people were looking for. For the new version of that. How did he die? Um, I did not look that up. I'm sorry. Um, but Ramon Navarro was the answer to that. Him? And actually, there was um, a, a lady uh, answer to that as well. It was Dolores Del Rio, which they were actually, uh, coincidentally, uh, second cousins. Um, Orale. And But yeah, they were the answer to that. They And, and so now you have an era um, of, uh, geez, I want to say <laughs> like the... And then you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's like the the 20s to the 30s, or maybe it's the 30s. It's the 30s to the 40s. You have this era of Mexicans emerging in cinema, where all of a sudden in in American cinema, where you have like like people like Dolores Del Rio, Anthony Quinn, Lupe Velez, Carmen Miranda, Raquel Welsh, uh, Cesar Romero, Gilbert Roll. I could go on. And these people are starting to like, and and because at that time we're trying to, like, the United States is trying to appeal to Latin countries because they're afraid of communist countries. So the United States starts this thing called the good neighbor policy, and and meaning that they're not going to get involved in Latin countries bullshit anymore. We're not going to we're not going to try to affect you guys. Our CIA is not going to fuck with you guys because they were afraid that because like Cuba and other Latin countries were starting to lean towards. Uh, dictatorships, they were going to become communists. And so the United States was, we need to put more Latin people in films in order to get Latin countries to love us. That's why you saw, like, in the 40s and 50s, like, those movies where they're, like, in Rio or they're in these, like, tropical countries and there's these, like, Chiquita Banana Lady yeah. dancing around, you know? Like, that's why. And then when that scare ended... The honeymooners eating tamales. Right. Exactly, dude. Yes. I don't know if that's real, but... No, they used to sell tamales in the streets, bro, of New York. This was an episode of the honeymooner where um, when when Norton, when that guy goes, I need me some tamales. Did he really? No shit. Some hot tamales. Yeah. So I... See, I'd never... Like, that's the thing is, like, growing up, I never paid attention to that type of thing. But yeah, you have that age. You have this this age of golden cinema, and then it bounces into. Funny how America has always used film to affect change, you know. Right. Yeah. Because um, when um, 
because they, cause they, America did that when they were trying to like um like when the the South like American South was all they were all Republican, you know. They were all they were all Democrats for a long time. Right. Not till 1963 when um 60 something when um Lyndon B. Johnson signed the 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 Civil Rights Bill. Yes. And then all the, all those all those Southern Democrats they got so pissed off they, they that's when they switched parties. Right. They switched parties to Republican. Right. That's when it, that, is that when it they, That's when they did the is switch. Is that when the switch went yeah. from like Democrats being more generous and Republicans being about more money? Yeah, and they, they did the switch, right? People. They did the switch Delicious. and um when they, when they did the switch and then when Nixon came in, they were trying to really get the South to be to vote Republican. So at that time it, it, I think it's called the the softening in the South, or the the make, they were trying to make the South not seem like a racist place, you know, because you know in the '60s all you saw was fucking white people with water hoses fucking up black people, right, and leash unleashing yes. their dogs. That was all the represent all what the South was all about, because that's the picture that people had in their heads. The South sucks. The South is a bunch of people that call everybody the N word. A bunch of racist KKK. white people. Yeah. So, during the time of Nixon, Hollywood started making the South funny. Right. That's when you get the Beverly Hillbillies. Right. You get all these shows that 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 are like it's basically the, coercion, is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, they're making the South dumb. Also, right. funny. They're not racist. They're just funny. And it makes, but it makes them harmless at the same time. Yeah, look, everybody starts thinking now, you know, the, oh, the South is all right, eh? Yeah, they're just dumb. Yeah, wow. So they really dumb in the so South. It's propaganda. I mean, they, Hollywood is propaganda. Yeah, they we know dumb that. in the South with these films. Oh my God, bro! What the fuck are we doing? And then Cool Hand Luke, you know, those movies based a lot of film based. The lot of movies were stuff about the Southern movie. They make them look like, like the lilies of the field. Right. Right. You know. Um. That cop, that that what, uh, like, oh, that that movie where there's a black cop in a white in a southern neighborhood that came out at the same time. Oh, Heat of the Night. Heat of the Night. Heat of the Night was crazy. Yeah, yeah. we got we got a white guy fighting with black people. Yes, and then you had Archie Bunker, who was like racist as Archie Bunker. But if you're a black person living in the South, like you're like, come on, man, it's all bullshit. Right. But for everybody else, like us. Who didn't know shit? Right. We're like, oh, bro, Dukes has it good, bro. You go to the south a lot. Yeah. How do you feel about it when you're out there? Why don't you do go there and do comedy, bro? But how do you feel when you're out and about? Nothing. You don't feel racism, right? There's nobody burning fucking crosses on your lawn in front of your hotel room. Only one time, bro. They dragged me to the show on the back of a pickup truck <laughs> and throw it hot like, and throw it like, hot. All right, guys. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for the ride. It was hard to, to throw a joke out there, bro. Like people yelling, build a wall. Nah. <laughs> they called that the Southern Uber back then. It was tough, bro. People were throwing hot sauce at me. That's fucking funny, bro. But that's what they expect you to say. But nah, it was good. It was good. But but yeah, man, that's that's like um, the, like you're saying uh, they were trying to show Mexico and Mexico was trying to throw in their film how beautiful it is yeah, with that, palm trees right. but hiding poverty. Right, and that's the thing is that they hide poverty. And back then, there wasn't really the the when they would show a movie, and even in Mexico, right in the cinema, it was always the struggle between rich and poor. Yes, yes. It was a class movie. Right. And so was so was a lot of British humor. But they they know black people to put down, right. so they put down black, uh, rich and poor a lot, in, right. and, and British. And here is black and white. You know what else I wanted to talk about? And I sent you that. Video. Talk to me, bro. I sent you that video that this morning. And I wish I would have did more homework on this guy, bro. But this was pretty amazing, and I found it last minute. Um, Juan Jose Laboreal. Juan Jose Laboreal is a Mexican actor. He's a Mexican actor born in Honduras, and he's black. Born in Honduras, and he's black. And, uh, but he's light skinned huh? He's no, he's dark as fuck. Oh, he's bro. the one that sings. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But he's also he plays the dad in the movie. The thing is, he's really well known because uh, at the time in that in that era of cinema in Mexico, there's no black actors. 
He was one of the only ones. He spoke Spanish. He sang. But the other thing he did he was... He was dark-skinned, bro. So, it was rare back right, then. Right. And they had him playing a lot of background acts, and they had him doing a lot of dumb bits. But there are three or four films that he actually did that were pretty um, prolific, um, and it was because um, it addressed the situation of racism in Mexico. There's this one scene that we watched together where um, the brother walks into his room, this very beautiful, light, white-skinned uh, Mexican woman and her white-skinned uh, husband-to-be. And he's telling him, don't marry this guy. He's, he's fucking lying to you. I have a secret to tell you. And she brings in his, he brings in his dad. And then he, he, the, 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 but then the dad walks in, right? The yeah, and then, the, and then the dad walks in. What did they find his ass? Um... I don't know. I, I gotta. I want to watch the movie. I'm gonna watch the movie. I'm gonna watch the movie when I get home to see more about it. But I thought it was incredible that at that time, even just a little bit, that they were addressing that issue. Because I mean, like we have racism. But this is a long time. I hit it was time, huh? I hit it was time, bro. I felt like black. If you were black in Mexico at that time, you were getting rocks thrown at you or something because they're so racist. I mean, we were racist to each other. Like the fact that Cantin Floss and Pedro Infante but, but, made it to those positions in 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 Mexican cinema, because at the same time, Mexico was like America. You had indigenous uh, Mexicans and you had uh, white Mexicans. And they treated indigenous Mexicans like Pedro and Cantin Floss like shit. And so it's amazing to see that those guys rose to the top like that. That's crazy, bro. What were you going to, you were going to say something before. I'm sorry, I interrupted oh, you. Oh, I forgot. Move on. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of other actors like Maria Felix. I was uh, saying that um, when you were naming all those actors, yeah. all at once, in, in my head, I was thinking none of them. Are darker than me, right? Because they're and even still, man. I mean, it's fucked up, dude. Like you go to Me if you ever even just go to Tijuana and cross the border, the people you see begging look like Indians. Oh yeah, man. Getting back to that, when I was watching television, yeah. Later on, bro, they, they showed uh they showed drug abuse and it was all Mexicans and blacks. Right, right. And that's something that I think we should talk about because we'll need more time on the next one. But that how this affected us how this affected us growing up how this affected me you our parents and even how latinos in hollywood now um affect you mean i could learn computer <laughs> <laughs> but i mean it's like how did we identify man how did that affect us because you talk about like hollywood making it as propaganda that's the thing is that we found and i think a lot of especially almost every country now Finds its identity in entertainment, in media. And so, you know, you're growing up, you're Latino, you're Mexican, you're in Mexico. You're watching these beautiful white people in your country do great things. You know what I mean? And and so I wonder what, because I, I, the other thing is when I think about it, all the clips that I've watched um, going over this of the Mexican golden age of Mexican cinema, there's no Indian people. There's no native looking people in there. And even the darker people, they put makeup on them to make them look dark. It was like, Mexico was like, we can't even have them as backgrounds. We need to fucking have, like, just put makeup on this guy and throw him back there. Crazy. Yeah. Huh? I remember watching a, mo a movie in Mexico when I was a kid. We used to watch a lot of movies, bro, at the, at the drive-in theaters in um, Santa Fe Springs. Right. Um, I forgot the name of the I forgot the name of the movie theater. The Sundown, or the the Fiesta Four at right. Pico Rivera, yes. right? Yes. And um, they they called it the Fiesta Four because there was four screens, and it was all bunch of bunch of cars watching it. It was a Fiesta of four screens. Yeah, bro. <laughs> and that was a swap meet where you could watch MC Pancho dance with Chamorita. You really, like, think about that when you're walking around and you just see, like you see like Fiesta Lanes or you see like uh, you know these these Latin terms put in front of something that don't like um, I remember Ford Fiesta. Have you ever seen I've been a having a Ford. It ain't no party, bro. <laughs> I remember seeing an apartment complex called the Vista View Apartments and I asked my dad because I didn't speak Spanish. I'm like, what's Vista mean? He's like, view. I'm like, so it's a view of the view? Is that what it's saying? Yeah, I, I saw it. That, that was then. Um, that's the projects, bro. That's the that's the that's the LA style. The LA style is to have a, a shitty apartment 
with shitty paint and then give it like a nice name. Like a nice, cool sounding name. What's that, bro? Oh, that's the Chateau in Paris. I've noticed that in LA. I have noticed that. And the, the Vista View, bro. There ain't no Vista and there ain't no view. The Vista <laughs> View is like what? That's two words that mean the same it's thing. Two bro. words that mean the same thing. The view and the view view. This is the view of the view. They call it the Vista View because, man, you got a Vista on your back <laughs> and you got to view your surroundings. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, I remember, like, um, like it, it, when you're when you're young, like, like that's a like millennial, millennials. You know, they're not they're, they they think they're woke. But they're only woke, you know, for certain things. Like, I would, like we were to watch, sit down and watch a movie together. I, I wonder who's gonna know it right away. Who's gonna be the bad guy in this movie without even telling us? Right. Like I could watch a movie without sound and know which one's gonna be the black guy. Not the black guy, but the bad guy. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be the black guy. It's gonna be the black guy. Yeah. Like he gonna like it's gonna it ain't gonna be the brown guy. No. It's gonna be the brown guy or the right. black guy. Right. Because I remember um, I met a man had a commercial. Had a ad, had a, a a bit. He said, "Yeah, man, I just came from a, from a I just got back from a badass uh, movie audition. I get kicked in the face by Steven Seagal twice. <laughs> We're trying to take down our airplane." Ah, yes, dude. What the um? When you were a kid, like when you were going to a, see a movie, you would just go see a movie, huh? Right. Me too. Just I just wanted to see the movie. And I had no idea what it meant or what it. And I mean, like this. whenever I I would see like a a Mexican or someone who looks close to me, it was just an added bonus, bro, for me. Like, oh right. shit, fuck yeah, and and that's all we would talk about on the way home, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how about that only Mexican in that movie, bro? Right. Or right. that fucking one black dude in that movie should have been in the whole fucking movie. Right. Yeah. Right. He should showed up like Boba Fett. Well, and that's the thing, man. Is like how. You know, like when we talk about representation, it's like, how do you how do you see yourself? You know, where do you see what was our visions of ourselves? Like nobody had ever seen a movie and said, "Man, there was too many Mexicans in that movie." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the movie was going great, man. To all these Mexicans started arresting white people. <laughs> And that was fucking fucked up. Yeah, you don't have that. Have you ever seen that first, first, first? Man, I'm sick of white people playing drug dealers in movies. I'm sick of it, man. I'm sick of seeing white chicks playing the whore all the time. All right, but that's Dancing Bear. Different story. <laughs> Sucking in random penises. <laughs> you watch random? Did you watch Dancing Bear too? <laughs> I love dancing there. I'm like, where is this? Bro. Where do I sign up for this job? We were we were we were at uh at the fucking Santa Monica Halloween Christmas Halloween parade. Right. And there was a dude walking around in his underwear and a gold chain yeah. and boots and wearing a bear a bear furry face. Furry bear hat. Motherfucker. I broke character and said, I seen bear. <laughs> and my and my wife looked at me like the biggest pervert, bro. How do you know that motherfucker? Oh, man, he's the guy that dances. Yeah. <laughs> he has the best job in the world. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, I would I, 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 I'm not even big enough to be dancing cub. Oh, my God, dude. It's so fucking funny, dude. I, 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 I was like, that's so, that's a real deep. I'll like, be dancing artery. <laughs> Ah, dude, I love it. <laughs> oh my god, bro! Yeah, man. Like nobody ever said. Like nobody ever said. Yeah, man. There's too many white chicks in porn. No, no. And that's what I want to talk about on the next episode. Is I want to talk about how it because you 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 are this. You know, think about how you grew up, man. Your role models were literally your parents. You're not, I'm not a white kid. And I imagine, like, if I'm a white kid, I could be John Wayne one day. I could be President Reagan one day. I could do all that. But if you're a Mexican kid in the 80s, your literal role model is your dad and the fucking janitor at your school. And so uh, when you start to look outward for other role models, 
a lot of us that grew up with, with TV, movies, and stuff like that was was that was movies and TV and cinema. And so I want to talk about how that affected us growing up, like how we saw ourselves as as Latinos in this country, and and what it meant for our own futures. Yeah, man. Did you play cops and robbers? Yeah. Who'd you want to be? I want to be the cop. You ever play cowboys and Indians? Yeah. Who you want to be? I want to be the cowboy. <laughs> of course not. Right. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. And, you know, that's what I want to, because it's like, yeah, you never want to be that guy. You you ever play plus the Crips? I still want to be the copy. <laughs> you ever play ch Cholos against Cholos? Yeah, I still want to be the I copy. still want to be the copy. <laughs> I want to be my mom. <laughs> But that's the way, like, these movies make you think, bro, without even know, subconsciously not even knowing it, bro. Yeah, yeah, no, And that's what I said, you know. Like, a, a white person has never walked out of a, a badass movie like like um, Something About Mary. Right. Like, that movie was hilarious. Right. But not one white dude walked out of that movie and, goes, and said, man, did you notice that there's only one black dude in there and he was married to a white chick? Right. Right, right. Or that no, nobody walked over and we go and said, "Did you guys notice that these motherfuckers were in Florida, and not one Cuban popped up in that movie?" That's what I'm saying, bro. No, Sometimes but they never people, said that. Nobody notices that shit, dude. But we notice. I do. Cause we're the people of color. Well, like I said, when we were watching, we were talking about watching The Walking Dead, dude. The one thing that stuck stuck out in my mind is like this Baptist fucking, this Baptist priest with three hot daughters. Is hiding in his house safely, and along comes this dude with this Asian guy, and the Asian guy starts banging his daughter, and he's completely okay with it. Or, and I'm like, "There's no world, that's why, like not in America." Like me, I can, I never, I have never watched an episode of Friends ever. No, like I cannot watch that show. And then when I remember comedians, when I was watching that show, watching that show, clipping it, they would say stuff that make me laugh. Like, come on, man. Right. You tell me they, they friend was for friends was on for how many years, and it was based in New York, and a motherfucker Puerto Rican, a Dominican, or an Ethiopian never walked in there and buy a coffee. They never even sold them coffee. There's not even like a fucking uh, a colored person behind the counter in those fucking shows. You know how I know that because my fucking stupid ass little sister used to watch that show. And that's how white people get food into moving to New York. And is gonna be all white people like friends. Right. Good luck. Next thing you know, man, you're going to buy a Cuban coffee, a guy who never smiles. <laughs> you're going to buy a Cuban coffee from a guy that has a cat on top of the bread. Right. You have no idea what you're getting into. Oh, sorry. Yeah, man, like, I remember, like, I, I remember, like, every, every movie I watched where a Mexican or a Latino or a black person or an Asian person popped up. Right. And I was like, yeah, that was badass. Totally, totally. totally. Like I'm like like that. Um, shout out to that actor, man, from um, from Ind Indiana Jones, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. Well, do you know who that guy ended up being? Yeah, he got a Golden Globe recently. Yeah, he's fucking Doc Ock. He was fucking also uh, played the husband of Frito Kahlo. No, no, I'm talking about the Asian guy. You're oh, talking about you're talking about Alfred Molina. No, I'm, I'm talking about Alfred Molina. I'm talking about Dr. Jones, the Indian guy, the Asian guy, the Chinese guy. Oh. Oh, the, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. The one riding the car. Oh, short stack. Short stack. Yeah. He, he he won a Golden Globe for um for that role he played in um Everything and Everywhere. No. Richard wait, what? Have you seen that? Have you seen that movie? Yeah. Richard what? Richard Wang, Richard bro, Wang. with a big Wang. <laughs> yeah, bro. You, so he stood out for me, uh, right? Because I knew in that movie, okay, Asian dude, he's badass. But in the back of my head, I kept the I was waiting for him to. Fucking do some karate on somebody, bro. Right. Right? And then um, when I saw 16 Candles, that Asian guy was the funniest guy in the whole movie. Yes. Yes. Totally. Totally. And I remember him to this day. Every time I, every time I see him, oh, that's the Asian guy with 16 Candles. Right. The one that does the laundry for those white people. Yes. Yes. Yeah, dude. I mean, they stuck out. Like, I remember like an old cop show, Bar Barney Miller. 
I know the Asian guy in that in that show. Yeah, and he was a cop. Um, I don't know his name. I'm a big I'm a big fan of that show. That guy didn't live long, but he had a great career. Yeah, bro, he was a stand up comic for yeah, many he was years. Stand up. He was a stand up. He used to perform at the Playboy at the Playboy clubs and all that shit. Like I remember, um, watching um a show called White Shadow. And there was a there was a, a a character in that show. His name was um, Gomez or Ghost or whatever. Right. And he was Puerto Rican, but he played Mexican in that in that show. What was the name of the show? White Shadow. White Shadow. It, it was Coach Reeves. Right. And um, it was a a guy that was an ex basketball player that goes to the South Central, um, Washington High, and and is, has to coach a, a basketball team, and they're all black. With one uh, Mexican guy. Oh, I remember. This is an old movie in like the 70s, It's right? a sh- It's a series, a sitcom. Okay, yeah. Anyways, that actor, he he, he plays Fr- Freddie Prince in a Freddie Prince movie. But um, he's the only Mexican in that movie, right? And they show him around, bro. And his episode had to... <laughs> his episode had to deal with child abuse, bro. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it stuck to my head because I remember like... He would get to school with bruises on his head. Right. And he had a little ass dad and he was fucking him up. Oh, wow. And I was like, I was rooting for him. Like, I wanted him to be in more shit. But he, yeah. wasn't, but he, he didn't do much shit. He didn't do much. And that's the thing. And that's, you know, again, like, I, I keep wanting to see more. And I go, oh, give me more of that guy. And then you don't fucking see him anymore. Yeah, man. History for fools. Thank you for listening. I'm get, yeah, I, I have another subject All right. that I feel like we can fill the hour on. So, oh man, thank you for listening to History for Fools. Um, please, um, very important, man. If you guys walk into like an Apple store or a Microsoft store, get to that laptop and subscribe the History for Fools podcast. <laughs> That's a great way of doing. Or if you ever grab your lady's yeah. phone and you if you're going through her messages, subscribe, and she says, "What the fuck are you doing with my phone?" You tell that bitch, bitch. You're now you're subscribed to History for now Fools. Now you're a fan of History of for Fools, bitch. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. See you guys next time.